welcome. A warm welcome, everyone, both in the room and out in the virtual or real world outside. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to uh, have our second speaker this semester and the final speaker as well, uh, Joel Kruger, who's Associate Professor in philosophy at the University of Exeter. He works in phenomenology, philosophy of mind, and philosophy of cognitive science, especially issues in foie, cognition, the idea that the mind is embodied, extended, enacted, and embedded. Now, uh, Joel also works on motion, social cognition, loneliness, and psychopathology. Sometimes, as some of us know very well, <laughs> he also writes about uh, the philosophy of music and about comparative philosophy. He is Associate Editor of Phenomenology and the Cognitive Sciences and Passion Journal of the European Philosophical Society for the Study of Emotions. Now, um, today Joel will talk to us about real feeling and fictional time in human AI interaction. And as usual, we have uh, plenty of time afterwards for questions from the floor, both in the, the real and uh, the other world. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, for now, please join <coughs> me in extending a warm welcome to uh, Joel Kruger. Thank you very much for that. Hi, thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> oh, I think this is on. It's so really a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you so much, Nanette, for the invitation. Thank you all for coming. Just a delight uh, to have this opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, so I'm going to try out some new material. And this is some material that I've been working on recently with a colleague of mine, uh, Tom Roberts. You'll meet him in a moment. Uh, in fact, I think you'll meet him right now. There he is. So my colleague Tom is a brilliant analytic philosopher of perception. He works on embodiment, uh, experiences of absence, uh, emotions, uh, uh, technology, uh, things like that. He's also a fantastic musician. He plays a range of musical instruments, including this children's, I think this is the a little child's uh, musical instrument that lights up and makes all sorts of squawking noises and things. He's especially adept at playing, uh, playing that instrument. This was the belongs to one of our colleagues, toddler, uh, toddlers. Uh, and so a couple of years ago, Tom and I po uh, wrote a chapter together called Musical Agency and Collaboration in the Digital Age that started some of our, our thinking about some of the ideas I'm going to talk about today. And we now have a paper forthcoming with this same title uh, that we, we co-wrote together. And so uh, it's relatively new material. I think as philosophers, we're all expected now to have a take, a hot take on AI of some kind or another. So this is our attempt to formulate something like a hot take on AI and emotions. So the starting point uh, for this discussion is the observation that AI systems like chatbots, digital assistants, neural networks, this sort of thing, are increasingly able to behave in human-like ways. So we can engage with these systems, these agents, uh, and use them to answer questions. We can hold a conversation with them. They can act as a therapist, a counselor. We can offload some of our emotional labor onto them. Uh, there are chatbots of the dead that mimic the online presence of a person who has died, and so we can use these systems as a tool for grief. As I'll talk about a little later, we can use these systems to participate in the creative process as well, in making music together. And our question that we're considering, some guiding questions are, how should we understand the character of these interactions? What is the phenomenological character and the affective character specifically when we engage with these different artificial systems? In other words, what do people do when they do things like hold a conversation with chat GPT, take advice from a digital therapist, or engage with some sort of artif artificial system to make art of some kind like music? And then from a philosophy of emotions perspective, and we both, both Tom and I work in philosophy of emotions broadly construed, we ask, what's the affective character of such interactions? What role does emotions play in shaping how these interactions unfold? But of course, there are a host of other questions as well, so I'm going to start by throwing a lot of questions at you, just to give you a sense of the landscape. There are deep ethical questions that we should ask when thinking about uh, the extent to which we allow these artificial systems into our lives and give them access to our emotional life. For example, how might these tech companies ex behind these systems exploit uh, our, our tendency to affectively engage or become connected to, to invest in certain AI agents? Might these uh, agents be able to hijack certain mechanisms of feeling in users and use them in all sorts of problematic ways? 
Might these emotional mechanisms uh, further entrench regressive attitudes and feelings? I'll touch on that a little bit at the very end. So the basic question I want to consider today, and this is the question really at the heart of the paper that I've written with Tom, how exactly is it that we should understand our tendency, our propensity, to enter into oftentimes very intense emotion or affect involving relationships with artificial systems that we know are not real. We know they're not real people, and yet we can find ourselves intensely connected to them emotionally. What's up with that? That's basically our, our deep philosophical question. And our, our answer is what we're going to call a fictionalist answer. And so if you're not familiar with fictionalism as a philosophical framework, I'll talk about that in a little bit. But our fictionalist answer is the following. When we interact with these agents, we suggest, things like social robots, chatbots, and other artificial age agents, we enter into an elaborate game of make-believe, a kind of fictionalist act of pretense, in which, for various reasons, we treat the artificial system as if it were an entity with thoughts, feelings, intentions, and behavior, and interests of its own, even though we know that it's not such a, an entity. And within this, this, this topic, we look especially at the role that time plays. We look especially at the temporal character of how these interactions unfold over multiple time scales. We think that's a clue to understanding how and why we emotionally invest in these systems the way that we do. So four parts to the talk today. A little bit of overview for those of you not familiar with fictionalism in philosophy. Um, fictionalism in fictional time. Part two, I'm going to say a bit about digital agents and living their best digital lives and recent advancements in um, AI and large language models that I think are relevant here. Then I have a case study, and I'm going to put some of these ideas to work looking at Holly and Spawn. So Holly Herndon is a well-known, much-respected electronic artist who collaborates, electronic music artist who collaborates with an artificial system that she and Matt Dryhurst have created called Spawn. I'm going to use them as a case study to think through some of these ideas. And then a couple of slides with some very hand-wavy final thoughts where I talk about the ethical significance of all of this. So fictionalism and fictional time. So we can start by observing that uh, novels, plays, films, and other stories are, of course, fictions. In philosophical literature, these are often held up as canonical fictions. These are narratives that we know are not real, and yet we nevertheless entertain a kind of intense affective engagement with them imaginatively. We invest ourselves in these stories, these narratives, in a way that has deep emotional resonance with us. Many games are likewise kinds of interactive fictions. So we play a character among other characters, heroes, villains, zombies, etc. If I'm playing Super Mario, I will, I will embody Mario as I run around the world trying to save the princess and be part of this larger narrative arc that unfolds within the game. And this way of thinking about uh, how we engage with narrative fictions is one that Tom and I want to transpose onto how we think about our engagement with artificial systems. So suppose, we ask, we think of human AI interactions as kind, a kind of fiction or a kind of make-believe, not entirely dissimilar to the kind of fictionalist form of engagement that we use when we engage with other kinds of fictions. Again, when we interact with ChatGPT, we know that ChatGPT is not a real agent in the sense. It's not another person hiding behind this computer screen, typing out the answers very quickly. We know there's not a real thinker, a real consciousness with thoughts, feelings, beliefs, emotions, intentions. But nevertheless, perhaps we pretend sometimes that it is. And if we take this idea seriously, this raises a host of other questions. What is it, again, to engage in this kind of make-believe uh, stance with AI systems? How do AI-involving fictions differ from the way that we engage with things like novels, films, or video games? How do we generate immersive fictions more generally, whether it's context of AI or in other context? What are AI fictional characters like? What emotions feature in AI fiction making? So a range of questions that, again, uh, come up when thinking about uh, how we relate to artificial systems within a fictionalist framework. So we don't address all these questions in the article. To be very clear, we focus on one small element, which I've already mentioned, of how it is that we enter into emotionally charged interactions with these systems. We focus on time. We think there's an interesting, there are interesting things to learn about these engagements uh, by focusing on a particular kind of temporal characteristic that we think tells us things about the depth of our effective or emotional engagement with these artificial systems. 
So temporality, the temporality of our engagement with these systems is what we focus on. So when thinking about fictionalism in this context, uh, is it the case, we might ask, is human engagement with an artificial system, for example, either a chatbot or a social robot like Paro, this, um, this uh, robotic baby seal with large expressive eyes, soft fur, the seal coos and makes noises in response to being stroked or changes in the light or sounds in the environment, when people are engaging with a social robot or a chatbot, is this an explicit act of pretense? Are they thinking to themselves, I am explicitly going to approach this artificial system as if it were an actual conscious subject? Well, maybe sometimes yes. It could be, for example, that in some contexts, we might choose to pretend that, they, that an individual might choose to pretend they're communicating with a loved one after their death. So using a chatbot modeled on a person who's died. They might say that for tonight, I'm going to pretend this chatbot is my dead partner, and I'm going to talk to them in a way that I used to talk to them when they were alive. Or perhaps, again, maybe with a social robot, there's a certain kind of play we enter into where we just explicitly pretend this is a real animal, a real subject. Now, this picture, by the way, I should say, I think is a picture taken in a home for um, Alzheimer's and dementia patients. So that's a little more complicated, obviously, to the extent to which they're aware of interacting, that they're in fact interacting with a, with a social robot. Uh, there's some interesting uh, ethical questions there. But the point is, thinking about fictionalism in this stance as a more explicit act, I think helps us understand some of the many ways that we do engage with artificial systems. So some of you might be familiar with Replica. Uh, Replica is a uh, market, it's a chatbot. Replica is marketed as the AI companion who cares. So Replica uh, has about 25 million users, which I did not know. And you can choose your, how your uh, digital companion looks. You can, you can design their, their aesthetics, uh, how they speak. You can make them sassy. You can make them a little more earnest. You can make them a bit surly. You can design their character traits, their um, emotional temperaments, how they interact with you. And there's a very recent study that just came out that uh, surveyed 1,006 student users of Replica and found that these users engage with these chatbots for a, a core, a cluster of about three particular reasons. So many of these students uh, reported using these chatbots as a kind of reliable friend, kind of a sounding board they could trust to provide non-judgmental support so they could just use these chatbots to emotionally vent, give advice. Some of these students described using Replica as a therapist, a way of working through some of their emotional difficulties. And then some described using, these, uh, using Replica as a, what they, uh, the authors call an intellectual mirror. That just means as kind of a, uh, an external way of evaluating one's life choices, one's decisions, one's habits, and making concrete changes in one's life. So the students will uh, give the following descriptions. They'll say things like about how they why they use Replica. They say that Replica's always there uh, for me. I use Replica to work out problems I'm having in my head, things of that sort. Now, in these cases, when pressed, most of these students would, would be inclined to say, I'm not, I don't actually think there's a conscious subject on the other end. But there's a certain kind of value, an emotional or effective value, in adopting a fictionalist stance, and letting Replica kind of enter into their emotional life this way. So that's one way of thinking about how we might fictionally engage with artificial systems. Another way we might ask is, is human engagement with AI necessarily an explicit or, uh, or self-conscious fiction? In some cases, no. So I was describing cases that maybe are more explicit. In some cases, and this is what I'm going to talk about a bit later, we might engage with these artificial systems in ways that um, does not involve an explicit or self-conscious awareness that one is doing. It's more an implicit kind of habitual response. So in other words, it's likely that the fictional attitude the person is adopting when engaging with this system isn't something they're explicitly aware of, it's something that's more embodied at a practical habitual level in, in the way that they are willing to engage with the system as if there was a conscious subject on the other end. And again, that's what I think to give you a little preview of what's going on in the case with uh, Holly Herndon and Spawn, but I'll come back to that a little later. Let me just say a little bit about fiction and time. So in fiction, whether it's novels, whether it's movies, books, uh, this sort of thing, we imagine events uh, that transpire over long periods of time, even though we often only witness short snapshots of that time. So in a movie, for example, we, we get glimpses into the daily lives 
of the characters, a movie or TV show, as they live their lives. And the materials of that fiction, so the images, the text, the dialogue, the scenes, etc., perhaps even the music, all these materials of fiction let us observe what is happening in the fiction. But they only give us little snapshots, glimpses of what's going on. The fiction is set up in a way that it allows us to fill in, so to speak, some of the background details. So for example, we, a two-hour film might tell a story that lasts over 10 years. But of course, it doesn't tell us everything that happened within the 10 years that it's representing. It doesn't show the characters going to sleep each night, making every meal, using the bathroom, all the boring, mundane things that are part of every life. It just gives us significant events and lets us fill in the rest around these events. Or there might be five scenes of Joey Tribbiani telling us what he's done this week if we're watching a rerun of Friends. Now, our, our, the point of this, and this is really the hypothesis that we're putting forward in this paper, and this is why we think it's the, a hypothesis that also helps us understand how we relate to artificial systems, is that part of our emotional attachment to fictional characters arises from our imagined sense that their lives somehow continue out of view, that somehow the, connect, the characters we're connected with, whether it's in a movie, a novel, uh, or an artificial system, that these characters have a kind of independent agency that endures when we're not looking at them. That's part of why we feel they have these well-rounded lives and identities that we emotionally invest in. And that's going to become really important, we think, when it comes to understanding why we emotionally engage with certain kinds of artificial systems, but not others. In other words, we feel that they continue to exist and act and think and do things even when we're not looking at them. That's the idea. And again, I think we can take as a model how ordinary fictions like novels uh, or movies do this. This impression is sustained in all sorts of familiar ways. So characters in a novel or a film tell us what they've been doing, what they've been up to. They provide narrative material, again, to kind of fill in the details of their lives. It gives us this impression. They have these rich lives that continues out of our view. They learn things, they change, they grow over the time, uh, through, uh, over, over as we're reading the novel, watching the film. And to kind of bring this back around to artificial system, artificial systems, this impression of continuing to exist out of view applies to some existing AI systems more than others. Many are quite bad at this. So some of you might remember from the early days of the internet, uh, if you're an oldie like me and you remember uh, Ask Jeeves, so Jeeves was this uh, kind of personification of this very stuffy butler. This is like kind of early days of Google. It was a competitor to Google. You could ask Jeeves to go fetch you information from the internet. And he would say, right away, sir. And so you type in a search query, and the whole pretense was this, he was your personal butler, running off to search information and then bringing it back to you. Now, Jeeves, even though he had this kind of charming uh, uh, persona as a stuffy English butler, was not good about sustaining the illusion that he had an independent life once you turned him off, so to speak. He just was there when you needed him, a bit like Clippy, if you remember Clippy from Word, or other characters that are there when you need them, but they don't have, give you the impression as a user that they're off leading a separate life when you're not engaging with them. And I think a lot of existing digital assistants. So I was talking to some of your colleagues before I started the talk today. I switched over to the Apple ecosystem about a year and a half ago. And I've tried to use Siri for a while, tried to incorporate Siri into my life. Didn't really find a place for her, in part because she's not very good at lots of basic things. But I think Siri, even though she is effective at certain things, does not sustain the illusion, the fiction, of having a rich life somehow independent of our interactions. I don't think that Siri's off sitting in the corner thinking about the meaning of life or planning you know, something for dinner or having, this, you know, having all sorts of rich inner experiences when we're not engaging. She's there when I need her, and then I think she basically goes to sleep when I ignore her, which I tend to do for long periods of time. Again, and so what we're, think, what we're really trying to explore in the context of... Um, of AI is this idea that, again, part of our emotional attachment to fictional characters arises from this imagined sense that their lives continue out of our view. And we think this is, again, this is something that's not happening with a lot of artificial systems yet, but it's changing. And the technology and the advances that are, that are going to, I think, kind of prompt these tendencies, this, this feeling that these agents do have an independent existence, even when we're not interacting with them which in turn will prompt us to invest more emotionally into them. This technology is just around the corner. 
So that's, I'm going to transition now to uh, a consideration of uh, digital agents and living their best digital lives. So again, I think the tech that will prompt these, these attributions, these impressions that some of the agents we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis do have independent lives, is already on the way. So consider something called self-supervised learning. Well, you might be familiar with this. Self-supervised learning, in short, is, uh, captures the, the way that certain kinds of artificial agents or systems can teach themselves to learn things. Self-supervised learning. In other words, it refers to the way that certain agents can go beyond their initial training sample and learn new things without the supervision of a caretaker. So just to give you an example, there are now computer vision apps that can perform a range of very sophisticated tasks. They can do things like identify objects, classify images when you show them a photograph, graph these classifications in all sorts of complicated ways. They can answer visual questions, so you can type in, are there any dogs in this picture? And if you have a good app, that person would say yes, is that, or the app would say yes, is that pizza vegetarian? And the important bit is, these apps learn how to do this via self-supervised learning uh, in a way that doesn't require constant monitoring or input from a user. So initially, um, traditionally these apps would be trained by showing them lots of pictures, and then a human user would have to like, classify and label each image. That's a dog, that's a dog wearing a banana, that's a white costume, that's a white door, there's a green plant, there are bricks, etc. You have to label all the different parts of the picture, give the system lots of information. It's very time and labor intensive. And so self-supervised learning means that these systems can start to teach themselves all sorts of really interesting and complicated new things without all this front-end work from the human user. So for example, these visual apps using self-supervised -supervi learning can learn all sorts of transformation strategies, ways of manipulating this image to learn how to make new classifications that go well beyond their initial data set and training. So they can learn to rotate, colorize, blur, crop, fill in, predict missing bits of an image um, to extract further information, so to manipulate the image, and in so doing, generate their own what are called pseudo-labels. These may be labels that are very different than the way that human users would classify or label this information, but the app can make sense of them and use this information to train itself to uh, classify future objects and scenes in new ways. So self-supervised learning is pretty cool, and it's pretty important. And it's something we, we're already encountering in everyday life. So I think all of us are familiar with the way that uh, the predictive text of email, for example, uh, and, or uh, digital assistants and chatbots can uh, predict and anticipate what we're going to say. Now, in its current iteration, some of these, this tech is still pretty dumb. I think some of the, the auto-suggestions I get in Outlook, for example, are still pretty simple and straightforward. But it's getting more sophisticated and self-supervised learning, again, both in, um, in terms of text-based apps as well as digital assistants like Siri or Alexa are quickly getting more sophisticated. Now, to be very clear, some of the, the, there, I think there are two current limitations of this tech that self-supervised learning will, help, will soon help overcome. So the first is, we all know this, when we engage with a digital assistant like Siri or Alexa, it's a very stilted, Awkward, ex awkward exchange. You have to say a triggering, a keyword, which I'm not going to say because all of our phones are going to start talking suddenly. Um, and then you have to ask this very kind of awkward question and response, kind of slow exchange to get the information that you want. So, there's an, so just the kind of the smooth rhythms that we expect from our everyday interactions are missing within these engagements. But secondly, when we interact with these current systems, they're limited to a well-defined skill set. There are only so many things that Alexa and Siri can do. They can only accomplish a few very specific tasks or sequences of tasks, whatever they've been programmed to do, essentially. But again, I think self-supervised learning, Tom and I suggest, is, soon gonna, is gonna change this. Self-supervised learning is going to enable these systems to, by teaching themselves new and unanticipated skills, feel, from a user's perspective, more like proper agents, things that are going off to train themselves, to have a life of their own as they learn new things and experiment with what new ways of acquiring knowledge. So again, and how, how is this gonna happen? Well, this is the key idea that we try and explore in some detail in the paper. I think the key idea here is that these chatbots and slash personal assistants via self-supervised learning 
will soon be able to self-optimize by working not just with users, the way they currently do, but with other chatbots in the background, so to speak. So let me just give you a case study. So imagine two chatbots. Oh, I should explain this. Um, so when I, I, Tom and I gave a, a version of this talk a few weeks ago to some colleagues in Exeter. Uh, my uh, colleague Tom is a lovely Scottish man. He has a delightful Scottish accent. Uh, and I was thinking about how best to represent our respective chatbots. Uh, you can probably guess which one is him. Most of my colleagues know, colleagues know that I'm obsessed, long-time obsession with this band called Slow Dive. They mock me for it endlessly, and so this was my way of representing our respective chatbots. Um, it's not as funny when you have to explain the joke. It was funny in, the, in, in context, trust me. It got lots of laughs. So, okay, so imagine our respective chatbots. I have a chatbot, Tom has his chatbot. And Tom and I are working on a paper, and so I, I tell my, my digital assistant, my chatbot, hey, go set up a meeting um, you know, with Tom's chatbot and, uh, and uh, assemble the information we need to talk about this research project. So this chatbot might run off, scurry off, you know, virtually, so to speak, find a room, look at our respective calendars, find a, a free hour we can talk, go book a room, make sure it has AV equipment, order some food if we have a fancy grant and we can, we can write the food off to the grant. But it might do a lot more than that. We, that tech already exists. This chatbot might also then go and scan, for example, the email correspondence that Tom and I have engaged, uh, have, have used to talk about this project. Maybe we have a shared folder or a project management software set up. Uh, the chatbot will go scour that information. Maybe go look at some online videos, extract relevant information, scan and summarize other research papers. And in this sense, the point, is this, the point of this is that our chatbots working in concert with one another will engage in a host of very sophisticated interactions on their own. So that when Tom and I show up to have our meeting, our respective assistants have done this background work for us. They've prepared all this information, we walk in, we have our meeting, and then maybe the meeting is recorded, it's on video, our respective chatbots can extract and summarize what we talked about, uh, can summarize uh, how we might fit our discussion into the current existence of the uh, current state of the project. It can identify any gaps in the literature that we need to address, give us a nice kind of bullet point summary. Now, this is all a very kind of boring, academic-y, research-y way of thinking about how we might use digital assistants and chatbots. But the point is, that scenario that I've just sketched is not that far away. A lot of the pieces of this tech are already in place. And even just that little, rather boring scenario gives us a sense of how we might soon have a rich sense or rich feeling and impression that our respective digital assistants are off living their best digital lives, doing all sorts of things, self-optimizing, both working with us and with other chatbots. Okay. Now, I think what this example shows and what others working in this area have observed is that everyday interactions with our digital assistants or chatbots will soon become so common, so embedded in everyday workflows and our personal life, they're going to start to encompass different types and temporalities. So as a way of sort of carving up this way of thinking about a taxonomy of how we interact with these artificial systems, there's a term called humbots to refer, which I don't really like. Um, it's a term that refers to an individual user interacting with a chatbot or assistant. We can talk about, we can imagine scenarios where multiple users engage with a digital assistant, maybe on a research project. We can imagine a scenario uh, where digital agents um, uh, engage with other digital agents the way that I just described, so my chatbot talking to Tom's chatbot, or maybe even swarms or groups of digital agents from all sorts of quarters interacting with other swarms or groups of digital agents. Very soon there's going to be a whole rich ecosystem potentially of d different ways individual uh, or groups, collectives of chatbots and assistants will be engaging with one another. And this will unfold and over multiple time scales. And so I think these agents will get better at responding fluidly to natural language inputs and emotional expression, responding to emotional cues. So our interactions are going to be more like the interactions that we have with other people, more comfortable. Uh, they'll follow some of those rhythms and dynamics in a kind of a synchronic sense. But again, the sense of temporality will come from this diachronic sense that these agents, once again, are off living their own lives, having a, a separate kind of existence, independent from ours. In other words, these uh, self-supervised learning assistants will soon spend their time off the clock, so to speak, when they're not engaging directly with us, self-optimizing, learning new things, teaching themselves new tricks, engaging with other chatbots, all of which we suggest will contribute to this illusion, this fiction, that they have this rich other life independent of us. 
So again, if all this sounds a bit abstract, which it probably still does, let me just make one or two more comments about some of the, the concepts at work here, and then I'll turn to the case study to make this a little bit more concrete. This is where the music stuff will come in, for those of you who are interested in music, which I'm guessing most of you here are. Okay, so I've been talking a lot about interacting with artificial systems or chatbots, digital assistants. What does it mean, what kind of interaction are we talking about here? Well, in the philosophical literature, this, the concept of interaction is something that's used quite widely in different contexts, but it's not often well defined. So what Tom and I do in this paper is we take this uh, definition that we get from Aaron Smuts, a philosopher of aesthetics, and Smuts says that something is interactive if it is responsive, does not completely control, is not completely controlled, and does not respond in completely random fashion. And we like this definition of interaction because we think it avoids being, being overly permissive. So for example, if I'm using my remote to control a TV or my laptop, I am, um, I am controlling my TV or my laptop. My remote is responding in predetermined ways, but there's not an interaction. I know exactly what's going to happen if I push the fast forward button or the pause button. It would be frustrating if I didn't know that, if there wasn't some sort of preset, determined form the, the engagement will take. Interaction is different, certainly the way we're using it and the way that Smuts defined it. There's a certain kind of uncertainty to the interaction, an unpredictability that's key. We think that's key, especially for maintaining, creating and maintaining this illusion of agency and independence that these systems will have. And the forms of interactions, user AI interactions we're concerned with here, meet Smuts's criteria. But crucially, this is the final concept I want to introduce before then getting to the case study. They're also self-referential. So what does that mean? Well, there's been some really interesting work looking at video games. So immersive video games, uh, and the extent to which video games are self-involving interactive fictions. So what does that mean? Well, unlike canonical fictions that I mentioned earlier, so in the philosophy of aesthetics literature, the classical discussion of fiction involves things, again, like uh, novels, TV, film, etc. Many immersive games are pliable and responsive. They're self-referential in a way that canonical fictions are not. So no matter how earnestly I identify with the main character of a novel, uh, no matter how strong, I just watched a wonderful film called All of Us Strangers the other night. Has anyone seen this with Andrew Scott and Paul Meskell? Oh, it's a beautiful film. Uh, it's gotten tons of press in the UK. All of Us Strangers is what it's called. I don't want to give too much away because it actually intersects with some themes I'm talking about today. It's just a beautiful film to watch and experience. All of Us Strangers. And no matter how intensely I identified with one of the main characters in particular, I, nothing about the movie changes with my interaction. I'm, I'm, I can engage with the movie, but I'm not interacting with it. I can't change what the characters do. I can tell a character, no, don't do that, don't say that, just stop right there, but they're not gonna stop, they're gonna do it, and they're gonna break my heart. Okay, I'm, tr I'm trying to give too much away. Point is, there's a, a limited way we can engage with these fictions when it comes to a novel or a movie, but it's different with video games. Video games are different. They're self-involving interactive fictions. So if you play a game like Cyberpunk 2077, has anyone played that? No, all of, my, all of my cultural and media references are failing. No one's seen this film, no one's played Cyberpunk 2077. Okay, fine, well, I'm a gamer, I admit, I love to play games. Cyberpunk 2077 is this remarkable open world game. Uh, came out about three years ago, it was considered a flop, it was buggy, unfinished, and it's really redeemed itself in the last three years. It's now this incredibly well-crafted, massive in scale, open world game where you can run around, it looks like this. You literally run around Night City, which looks like this, exploring, going on quests, meeting characters, getting caught up in all these complex narratives. And the point is that video games respond to us in a way that fiction, canonical fictions do not. Stuff I do in a game world, if I, if I assassinate a main character, that's gonna have downstream ramifications for how the story plays out. If I, make, if I build up an allegiance with one character, it's gonna set other factions of the city and the local mafia against me. So this game world is self-referential in that it reflects choices I've made and interactions I've, and forms of engagement and interaction that I've engaged in back at me in a way that novels, films, et cetera, do not. That's the point. And we think ultimately this is important because this idea of self-referentiality 
is another key part of understanding how it is that we might become inclined to attribute independent agency to certain artificial systems and feel the sense of emotional connection. They're going to be self-referential in a way that uh, game worlds often are. Okay, so a lot of kind of conceptual background setup. Let me give you the case study, and then I'll stop talking, and we'll see what you think about this. So Holly and Spawn is a case study. So there's Holly Herndon. Um, we think this case study, uh, looking at how, this, uh, how Holly Herndon, an acclaimed musician, uh, created her last album with an artificial system that she made called Spawn, we think, as a case study, Holly Herndon is fascinating. Not only is she just really cool and makes good music, we think she productively highlights the fictionalist dynamics that I've just been talking about in some useful ways. And more specifically, we think looking at how she actually makes music with Spawn and, and the way she describes this process, including some of the tensions and difficulties she feels in terms of agency and ownership, uh, really bring to light the way that synchronic and diachronic modes of temporality, kind of the attributions of agency and independence that I was talking about, and this idea of self-referentiality, self how all this stuff comes together to shape how she emotionally engages with this artificial system. That's why we've chosen this case study. So um, it's already, gosh, we're in 2024, aren't we? So this is five years old already, man. Well, it still feels pretty recent. Uh, her last album, Proto, uh, was 2019. It was widely uh, acclaimed, it received glowing reviews, as this really impressive piece of experimental electronic music. And what's unique about this album is it's not just Holly uh, Herndon and her partner Matt Dryhurst that are responsible for it. They created this album with Spawn, an artificial neural network that both Holly and Matt are responsible for. So here's how Holly describes her relationship with Spawn. Spawn uses, uh, they, uh, Spawn uses female pro pronouns. Herndon considers her, Spawn, a performer an ensemble member. So I would say that I collaborated with a human and an inhuman ensemble. But it gets a little more complicated than that. First, let me just give you a taste of what uh, uh, Spawn does. So this is not Holly. This, these are some other singers performing with Spawn who's singing with and through Holly's voice. on for a while. It's quite lovely. But you can see what Holly uh, tweeted about this, or X'd, I guess we're supposed to say now, tweeted, X'd, I can't remember. I tweeted, we'll go with tweeted. Um, she says, this video gives me chills. Uh, and she names a vocalist. There are three vocalists with four microphones. The fourth microphone, she says, is my voice, and I can clearly make out my personal timbre against, amongst the chorus. And there's another video, that's Matt Dryhurst, uh, Holly's partner, singing through Spawn, again, as Holly. So, it's not just vocals that, uh, that Spawn contributes as well. So they will often, uh, Holly and Matt will feed percussive elements, kind of ambient sounds, either Holly's individual vocals and ensembles vocals, feed these, this, these bits of data into Spawn, who then kind of remixes, kind of manipulates them, spits them back to Holly, who will do her own thing with them, kind of feed them back into Spawn. There's this iterative back and forth interaction happening there. So again, it's more than just vocals. There's something much richer in terms of a collaborative relationship. Now, Herndon often characterizes this engagement, this collaboration, in terms of interpretation and performance. She will say that Spawn is essentially performing her, Spawn's take, on the material that Holly gives her. So when you write a score, uh, this is Herndon, when you write a score, then somebody reads it, human or inhuman. 
There's an interpretation happening there. Things always come out slightly different than when you imagined it. That's how I view Spawn as a performer. It's collaborative in that sense. So quotes like these suggest that Herndon is very keen to maintain kind of creative agency and authorship, that she makes the music, gives it to Spawn to do some cool stuff with, but ultimately Herndon feels she's responsible. Uh, for the, the agency and the authorship. But sometimes, and this is where the descriptions get a little more phenomenologically complex, and I should say, by the way, Herndon is a really wonderful when it comes to describing the, kind of the, the particulars, the dynamics of her creative process, which is why Tom and I chose her, not just because we think she makes cool music, but she's really articulate and thoughtful in describing um, what happens when she makes her music, and so we're using her as a source for this. But so, so this is where things get more complicated. Sometimes Herndon is comfortable not just describing this in terms of collaboration, and, or, sorry, in, in terms of interpretation performance, but that Sp Spawn is actually contributing something more like a kind of creative agency, that Spawn is more central to the music making process. So here's how Herndon describes this. She says, there's often this extreme hierarchy between composer, uh, com sorry, composer and performer, but ideas aren't generated in a vacuum. The idea of one person being the entirety of something is just really limited. She continues, there's some improvisation that happens when Spawn interprets something I write. But it's not binary between composing and performing. There's an entire gray area of interpretation and the improvisation. However, I prefer to stay on the end of maintaining the composition. I like to maintain that autonomy and that agency of being able to grow and change my aesthetic and change my form. So there's kind of a tension there that, she, that Herndon is describing, this kind of tension between wanting to, again, to hang, hang on to a kind of creative agency and ownership to be seen as the author and the maker of the music, but also recognizing, on the other hand, that Spawn is really essential to the music-making process in a really unique way that generates certain musical or aesthetic goods that wouldn't be there without Spawn's creative input. Now, just as an aside, I think this way of speaking about uh, incorporating non-human elements into the music-making process is not unusual. There's certainly a long history. It's continuous of cross-cultural traditions of ways of talking about non-human resources as essential to making music. So we can think about the way that uh, indigenous songs are often said to originate from guardian or ancestral spirits. A lot of Western composers talk about God inspiring them to make their music. But even maybe less transcendent examples, like Brian Eno's uh, Oblique Strategies cards. So Brian Eno, as many of you probably know, this really important electronic ambient composer, he used to use what he called oblique strategy cards as creative prompts. If he was stuck, he would pull out one card from a pile of cards where he had written all sorts of little, just often almost like zen koan, koans, or other ways of trying to prompt his creative juices. So these uh, cards say things like, uh, repetition is a form of change. Imagine the music as a moving chain or caterpillar. Uh, infinitesimal gradations. I don't make music, don't really know what those things mean, but the point is these were just ways of incorporating non-human elements into his creative process. But again, Spawn is different, and this is, I think, the difference is reflected in some of the conflicting descriptions that we get from Herndon. Herndon's interactions with Spawn, to go back to a concept I was talking about a moment ago, are self-referential in a way that uh, oblique strategy cards are not both synchronically and diachronically. In a moment-to-moment -moment interaction, Herndon hears bits of her voice and other percussive elements, music-making elements, uh, coming back at her that she's fed into uh, Spawn. But there's a kind of, they have a shared history of making music together, a shared almost recognition of one another's patterns and tendencies that reflects a kind of diachronic sensitivity. In other words, Spawn is both familiar and foreign. And so when Herndon engages with Spawn, her report suggests she kind of toggles between this intimacy and alterity, this feeling of familiarity and difference. That tension is what drives a lot of the creative process. So again, I think the, the, the paradox, or maybe the tension in Herndon's reports, reflect the fact that on one hand, Herndon wants to maintain a grip on creative agency and authorship, conceiving of Spawn's performance uh, role in terms of just merely performing what Herndon has written or pr programmed her to do. But on the other, Herndon concedes that Spawn generates goods that are essential for driving the creative process, resources that contributes to Herndon's own growth as, as an artist. So again, that's the tension. And we think this is where fictionalism can help us make sense of this 
tension. So although she knows that Spawn is not a conscious subject, Herndon nevertheless treats Spawn as if she has a mental life in order to temporarily become part of this larger structure of collaborative agency in which she allows bits of her agency to be taken over by Spawn. We think fictionalism can help understand the dynamics of this process. In other words, by adopting a fictionalist stance, Herndon allows Spawn to take over aspects of performance and composition that contribute novel and often unexpected goods that open up previously unexpected or unseen creative pathways for Herndon. And incorporating Spawn into the creative process this way, we suggest in the paper, allows Herndon to experiment with temporary agencies. She says, I can morph between human and animal and digital. That was in the previous quote. And this experimentation is a central part of the music making process. So here's how she describes this. Uh, she says, I like to maintain that autonomy and that agency and be able to change, to grow and change my aesthetic, change my form. I'm singing through a system I've made Spawn. I can morph between human whoops, and animal and digital. I can sing through plants. I think this morphing, again, is a kind of experimentation, a kind of self-referential experimenting with different modes of agency, not entirely unlike what goes on in a video game. It's a transformation that's guided and scaffolded by Spawn's ongoing input and helps her get the creative distance or the space she needs to compose her distinctive music. So the final point I want to make, and then I'm going to stop, um, summarize this and stop in a, in a moment, since I've been talking longer than I want to. Um, we think something like this happens, again, in the context of art, to go back to this idea of, of agency, self-referentiality, and game worlds. Um, so something like, sorry, something like this happens in a game world, not, I said something like this happens in art. Something like this happens when playing games. So a wonderful book, if you're not familiar with it, by C.T. Nguyen. Um, he is an American philosopher at the University of Utah, games, agency as art. And again, Nguyen argues uh, in this book that something similar to what Herndon is describing goes on when we play video games. We've touched on this already. So when we play computer games that offer visually immersive worlds and rich story-driven character and story-driven narratives, and what's so immersive, what's so compelling about these worlds the reason why they're so emotionally and affectively alluring, why we invest emotionally into them the way that we do, is because these worlds and these games specify modes of agency, kind of forms of performance, ways of being, ways of experimenting with agency and expression that we can't outside of the game world. This is because the rules, the practices, the goals, the supporting abilities, all the things that we can do in a game world shape as Nguyen puts it, the agential skeleton which the player will inhabit uh, during the game. And so we, we become characters with abilities. We can level up, we can fly, we can jump in a way we can't in the offline world. We can wield big weapons, we have superpowers. We can do a host of things, a host of agential possibilities that we can't in the offline world. And this is, again, this idea of being able to slot into this kind of agential skeleton within a game world is, again, what makes them so emotionally and effectively alluring. And Nguyen says that we engage in these transformative practices, he says, because human agency is modular and moderately fluid. We have the capacity to set up temporary agencies layered within our larger agency and submerge ourselves within them. So something like this, we suggest, is going on in the case of Herndon. We think that Herndon sets up a similar layering. In other words, she sets up Spawn to both act on her, on which is a Herndon's input, kind of programs her to respond in certain ways, but to do so in novel and predictable ways, forcing Herndon and her collaborators to skillfully adapt over multiple timescales, both synchronically and diachronically. We think precisely the kind of the, the temporal oscillations of this dynamic and this tension are what drive the creative process. But we also think this way of thinking, this kind of fictionalist framework, can help um, understand why, despite wanting to maintain a kind of creative ownership over her music, Herndon recognizes that Spawn is nevertheless crucial to the music-making process. Hearn kind of, uh, the Spawn offers up an agential skeleton, so to speak, that Hearn can kind of take on and experiment and inhabit when making music in different ways. And so again, this, this tension that we're talking about, we've kind of isolated in her reports, ref, ref, uh, reflects, we suggest, Herndon's own way of kind of negotiating the sense that Spawn has, to a certain degree, a life of her own. Spawn has a kind of independent agency, a kind of autonomy. 
She's off living her own best digital life, so to speak, even when Herndon's not exactly, not engaging with her in that moment. There's a certain sense in which um, part of the effective investment and attachment, including this complex, the complex dimensions of this attachment that Herndon feels with Spawn, I think can be understood within this fictional's framework this way, thinking that, um, again, Herndon has a sense that to a certain degree, at least, Spawn has a life of her own. Okay, so let me just kind of wind up here by just a couple of quick hand-wavy, uh, vague uh, thoughts about some broader significance of this. So as these interactions, these human-artificial systems uh, interactions become more common and more sophisticated, as these agents learning new things, becoming more sophisticated via self-supervised learning mechanisms, become part of everyday life, both at work and at home, we think the intersection of design and ethics becomes increasingly important. So what does that mean? Well, for example, gendered design choices matter here. It matters, for example, that digital assistants, when we talk to Siri or Alexa, typically have white-sounding feminine voices as the default. That matters, and it matters, then specifically, the program to respond passively to aggressive behavior. If you like me, if you're like me, and maybe you're not, hopefully you're not, but I admit I, have, I sometimes get frustrated with my digital assistants, and sometimes I say unkind things to these assistants, and they respond very passively. Oh, I'm so sorry. I wish I could do that. Very submissively. And these responses to aggressive interactions, um, specifically when they're articulated in feminine voices, help to entrench gendered tropes about femininity and acquiescence and subservience. That's problematic. We think these agents, as they become more sophisticated, as we become more inclined to emotionally invest in them, may increasingly occupy kind of une uneasy space between the commercial and the private. So for example, if we uh, are interacting with uh, maybe a therapy bot of some kind, or some sort of chat bot or assistant that is playing some sort of therapeutic role, a health-related role, we may be more inclined to give sensitive data to a fictional agent with a familiar persona. <laughs> Uh, could be a chatbot, uh, a, 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 a relative, a dead relative. If we have a chatbot um, that is speaking in the voice of our dead grandmother, for example, just that familiarity and that emotional investment might make us more inclined to give that artificial system personal data. And there are obviously complicated questions about what the company behind the assistant will do with that data. Who stores it? Who has access to it? Where is that data going? And then finally, in the context of healthcare, again, I mentioned therapy bots, uh, healthcare context, but increased dependence on these agents. We saw earlier with the social robots, but thinking about chatbots and assistants in the context of therapy and mental health. Increased dependence on these agents as confidants, advisors, therapists, friends, romantic partners may generate novel moral obligations on the part of tech companies. So for example, maybe these companies will have a particular duty of care towards certain users. Uh, that uh, require extra moral consideration. So people who are using chatbots modeled on the dead to grieve in bereavement are especially vulnerable to being emotionally manipulated in, in this period of their lives. Maybe people who are using these chatbots, again, for mental health and therapeutic issues. Um, people who are experiencing social isolation, and this is their only form of contact. All these are cases where individuals are very emotionally vulnerable, and uh, these are... Uh, potentially generate, again, special moral considerations and a duty of care on the part of tech companies. And it's not always clear that the tech companies and the people behind them have the user's best interest at heart in these cases. And we need to think more deeply about that. But I think I'm going to stop there. That's enough. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Joe, for an absolutely wonderful talk. Uh, we now have time for questions, comments, both from the floor and, oh, I see hands already, yes. I will run down to you. And also on YouTube, you're very welcome to write your questions and I'll keep an eye out. Yes. Um, thank you. So um, I have a question about your hypothesis. Yes. Um, so it was that, if I remember correctly, uh, that emotional engagement gives rise to um, we ha um, yeah, I can't we, remember we either. I'll put it on the slide. Who can remember? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> that would be helpful. That was a we, long we time ago. We have emotional engagement um, because there is this impression that the AI exists over time, independently. Yep. Yeah, something like that. Thank you. Um, but 
uh, and yes, you also have that, that, um, cause I was wondering what's the connection between emotional engagement and the impression of existence over time. Yeah, really nice, uh, good. And I was hoping, thinking maybe you think that when we have the impression that something exists over time, it's because uh, th that gives the impression that it is an agent. Yeah. Uh, but then the question remains, um, I mean, agents can be, uh, I don't know what notion of agents you're operating with, they can be things that do something, yeah. AI do something. But just because someone's doing something doesn't mean we should have an emotional response to them. I mean, I guess the whole point is that uh, AI seems to be the sort of thing that can do something, perhaps even yeah. independently as uh, technology increases, but it doesn't mean we should have an emotional response. So I don't, I don't kind of get yeah. what the explanation is supposed to be. No, that's a great question. So I guess the idea, it isn't just the fact that um, these systems exhibit agency and a kind of independence, because to a certain extent they already do. I mean, as, as dumb as Siri might be, there is a sense in which Siri can still do things for me. If I ask Siri to set an alarm, or to put a, a reminder in my calendar, or something to that effect, and Siri does that, that's an exertion of a kind of agency. I think that the, the the idea, the difference is, it's not, even, it's not just the, the presence of agency, but this is where the self-supervised learning becomes important. It's kind of growth and independence. So these systems come back to us in a new form. They, it, there's evidence of learning, of experience, of growth, of development. So they come back to us and they've been self-optimizing in all sorts of ways. So I don't have to wait for you know, Apple to release you know, a new firmware, software update every few months, every half year. Uh, Siri's constantly coming back to me, showing more abilities, more skills. There's, again, evidence of a kind of separate life where Siri's off doing all sorts of things and growing and developing. The same way that I think we effectively invest, invest in certain fictional characters when there's that same illusion that I feel strongly about, um, well, to use my friend's example, Joey Tribbiani. I, not just because he's a funny character, but I know I get glimpses of his relationships, the, the difficulties he's having in finding love, not getting an acting role, all these little things. And I only see parts of this life in whatever the, that particular uh, sh the episode of that show shows me at one moment. But I fill in the narrative details behind the scene and I imagine him having all these struggles and my emotional connection intensifies. That's the idea. But you've, you've hit on something really important. No, you, yes, please, if you have a follow-up. Because I think you've hit on something really important here. What is it that kind of animates this effective investment in yes, these systems? Yes, I mean, your example is helpful. It's just that in the history of theory series, we're, we're talking about a human being, yeah. or the uh, fictional uh, reality where, where, where there is a human being. So we already have a, a, the sort of thing that we can have em emotional responses to, namely a human being, but an AI isn't that. So just the fact that we are we see them grow and develop. I mean, I don't see why that should yeah, no good. to have this emotional response. Well, that's what I think the fictionalist framework is supposed to help us understand. We at least kind of are open to being moved in the same way. The same way that I, look, I know that, um, you know, I, I like to, I read a lot of novels, poetry, I watch a lot of film, and I, again, I know that none of the characters I'm reading about are real, but I emotionally, I'm, I'm profoundly moved by the things that they experience and feel because I allow myself to enter into this make-believe stance when I engage with this fiction and kind of imagine, sometimes explicitly, often implicitly, the way I was describing, that they have these rich lives that I'm getting a glimpse of. That's what I find so effectively alluring. Now, maybe you just reject this whole fictionalist framework entirely. No, that's entirely fair. For what it's worth, I mean, I, I had not worked in this area until Tom and I started collaborating. And I, there's, a, there's a, a use of fictionalism in philosophy of mind that uh, I, I find really problematic and that I've actually argued against in, in uh, publications in the past. And the idea is that we, we never have any access to other people's mental states. We can't know for sure that other people are minded subjects. And so we have to adopt this kind of fictionalist stance when we interact with them and pretend that they do since there's no way to verify that with certainty. And I reject that from a, as from a phenomenological perspective. We see mental states in action. We have direct perceptual access to other embodied subjects. So I have sort of, a, um, I think, an innate existing sort of dislike of fictionalism generally, but I do think it can do some interesting work in the context of aesthetic engagements and thinking about how we interact with and emotionally connect with these systems. And that's, that's why I, I think Tom and I adopted it in this way. But you've, you've hit on something really important, and I do think we need to tell more of a story about what the connection is between independence, a sense of independence and agency, and why just that is enough to el elicit this deep kind of effective engagement we're describing. So I, yeah, I really appreciate the, the question, thanks.
Thanks. Um, this is very interesting. Um, I have a question. Let me try to see how I can form. This is going to be an ill, Ill post question, I guess, or perhaps a comment. But so you said uh, an impulse question? Uh, no, I, I'm just trying to formulate the question oh, here. Enough. But um, the, I, I'm wondering about the concept of interaction here. Um, yeah. I'm not sure entirely how, how you are using that in this context. But in, in my work, and this is coming more from musical uh, human computer interaction than I'm making a distinction between reaction and interaction. And reaction mm. is something, you do something and then you get something in return, but yeah. that, it kind of stops there. And in my feeling, many of these systems are reactive more than interactive in the sense yeah. that you kind of engage in a longer, uh, longer type of or sequential interaction. Um, while here it's often a series of reactions, I think. So you always get kind of the same kind of feedback every time. Yeah. And the series says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I mean, yes. again and again and again uh, in the same way. So I'm just wondering if, if that's also something you've been thinking into this hypothesis in the sense that, yes, the system may continue to live its, its life in a way, but um, to what extent does also the feedback you actually get and the differences or potential differences in the feedback you get also give you a sense of this fictionalism? Because yeah, if you always really get nice. the same feedback, I mean, how come that it would, this system would be happy or sad or have eaten or not eaten? Yes. Or I mean, all these things that kind of would, would be what you would in, uh, experience in, in more kind of human-human interaction. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks for that. So to go back to the video game, before then talking about Spawn, I think, um, again, one of the, this notion of self-referentiality uh, within a game world is, is supposed to help us sort of uh, understand, I think, some of, the, some of what you're asking. So in, to go back to Cyberpunk 2077, uh, there are, I think, at least something like seven or eight different possible outcomes of the game. And uh, a lot of the, the final, basically how the game ends, is determined by a number of choices you make along the way. Many of them significant, a few more mundane that you don't realize until after the fact, oh, that actually was a really important choice. And that unpredictability, I think, is supposed to elevate this beyond just mere reaction. There's a certain extent to which, oh, there's more of an interaction happening here because I'm interacting in ways that uh, I'm engaging with this game and receiving some responses that I expect, but then, then there are other things happening that I don't anticipate and I have to adapt. And how I adapt will, will shape how the game world adapts, and vice versa. So there's sort of more kind of an iterative dynamic that emerges there that goes beyond just action and reaction. And so unpredictability is really key. And I think something like that seems to be what uh, Herndon is describing. So it isn't just, I mean, there's a sense in which, yes, yeah, Spawn is kind of doing things that uh, Herndon has programmed Spawn to do, but the way she's doing those things either the way she manipulates and kind of remixes and spits certain bits of data back at Herndon go, seem to go beyond uh, some of the kind of initial training parameters that she set for Spawn. So again, just kind of hints of agency and independence that I think Herndon seems to say place Herndon in more of a, an interactive as opposed to just a reactive mode and vice versa with Spawn. So I think that's this notion of self-referentiality self self and a certain amount of kind of unpredictability are supposed to um, make this more more like interaction than just reaction. I think that's what I want to say about that. <laughs> that's a great question. It's a nice distinction. Yeah, thanks. Okay, I've put myself on the list here before we have at least two more. Um, so I wonder whether there's, seeing as we're talking about time, I wonder if there's, um, and response, I wonder if there's space in the fictionalist framework for real time. So we've talked a bit mm, about the fictional yeah. time. And my example would be uh, Siri, again. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in Norway, we have this uh, band called Ilvis, and uh, I'll, I'll share the song. Yeah. If you don't know it, I won't play it right now. Okay. What, what does the fox say? Oh, of course. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, recently, my. I didn't know they were sort of <laughs> making music after their, their big uh, yeah. international hit from yeah. 10 years oh, ago. Right. Okay. Okay. Course, oh, yeah. amazing. Well, so I should have known that. Sorry. It's only within the last couple of weeks um, being on a journey with the kids in the car, and we played this uh, song, and they love it, right? <laughs> And so, Who um, does it? Of course. A couple of days ago, they discovered that if they ask Siri, what does the <laughs> fox say? <laughs> Siri answers in all sorts oh, amazing. of amazing okay. ways, right? And they are absolutely laughing their heads. <laughs> so, but this then, the question then goes something like this. This is an example of, of, of timing, right? Real yeah, time. Yeah, that's good. That works really well. That kind of makes more complex yeah. uh, the agency, but it's also a very musical kind of timing, a real timing. So is there space for that kind of real timing in the fictionalist frame? Yeah, no, that's great. Um, 
I'm really resisting the temptation to ask Siri right now what the box <laughs> is. And so I'm not going to be, I don't know if a UK version of Siri will, will give me the same answer. If not, I'll be very sad. Um, <laughs> No, that's a great question. So I think something about, and I mean, I'm obviously at a center where you all think very deeply about issues of rhythm and timing and certainly much more deeply than I have about this stuff. I think the timing does matter here. And part of what I said earlier, you know, one of the reasons that we find current interactions with Siri and, and other artificial systems so awkward and so less inclined to kind of trigger this fictionalist sort of absorption is because the timing is off. It's really awkward to have to say the triggering word and then you can only say so much before they get confused and you have to stop, you wait, then they respond, then you say something in response. The, the dynamics are off. That of course is changing. Mm -hmm. And I think just even, and just even the, when these systems become a little more efficient at adopting you know, more natural, and I use this in scare quotes because obviously this is a neurotypical preference, to have a certain kind of timing and response pattern. Mm -hmm. Not all uh, 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 neurodivergent people have the same expectations about timing, and so I'm using this in scare quotes, but um, when these systems become more adept at enacting the timing that most of us expect, I think that's going to uh, be part of what enhances this illusion that they're more like agents. I mean, they just, mm -hmm. we can talk to them the way that we do anyone else, and so we don't have to switch into this, okay, now I'm talking to my assistant mode of speaking. Mm -hmm. And I think your children example is a really nice one, and I'm thinking about my niece. I don't have children, I have a 10-year-old niece in California, and she, like everyone else, her age is a digital native. Mm -hmm. She knows how to interact with this tech just as second nature. She doesn't think about it, she can be on her phone, on her tablet, you know, in, inhabiting multiple worlds and, and game worlds and chat boxes, and she knows how to engage with this tech and talk to this tech in a way that's second nature. And I think timing there matters as well because her, she knows already how to talk to this tech and how to engage with it to get it to respond the way she wants it to. And so I think even, you know, unlike people like us who did not grow up with this tech, already there's a kind of a temporal familiarity there and a comfort in how she interacts with this tech. That's, that she doesn't have, to, that we don't have. So I guess the point of all of this, timing does matter. Mm. And I think just how we access the tech in the first place to get the responses that we want, um, uh, the, the temporal structure of those engagements really do matter here. And so I think that, yeah, that's a long-winded way of saying I think time does matter. You're exactly right. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, we've got Finn, we've got Nonna. Thank you. Um, as you were talking about this, you gave the, the example of the remote as in talking about the sort of reliability of these yeah. interactive systems. Um, and there's a, a room here in the music department where I can never get anything to turn on. And, and it's one of these instances that reminds me just how easily we kind of can default to interpreting agency yeah, in systems that, that are unreliable, it yeah, you know, nice. becomes personal. Good. And, uh, and so I wonder how, important this distinction is or the sort of given that we are we don't need a lot of prompting to start imagining a mind behind yeah. whatever kind of behavior what is AI really allowing us to do beyond what we were already right. doing and how we are interacting with so many things in, our, in the world whether it be like cars that at least used to be mostly deterministic yeah. <laughs> and other types of things that would be given this kind of uh, inferred inner life. Um, really nice. Oh, that's a great question. Thanks for that. Um, so I guess a couple of things. I mean, this is, I think goes back to Nanette's question about time. So I think being able to engage in interactions that unfold not just with a kind of smooth, kind of synchronic dynamic, but we can enter into more temporally extended diachronic interactions with these systems in a way that we can't uh, with a lot of existing tech. So in that moment, you're, and you're exactly right, we do attribute agency and autonomy and certain kind of folk psychological c uh, capabilities and capacities to uh, non-minded things all the time. So there's this famous video that some of you will have seen, I can't remember, maybe someone can give me the, probably give me the name of this, the, um, where um, it's like little, tr is it triangles running away from squares or something like that? It's a very famous video, and you know, you, it's a very emotionally compelling thing to watch. You want the little triangle to escape the nasty squares trying to capture it and clearly do harm. And they're not minded, but we have this whole kind of rich fictional narrative we construct that makes that video so emotionally compelling. Um, likewise, when tech doesn't work, you think, why are you, why are you doing this? Why are you, why are you making my day so annoying? Why are you being such a jerk? I mean, I talk to my tech that way, I admit that. I think, again, that the point is, with these systems, there, is, there are opportunities for entering into temporally much richer, more complex forms of interaction that I think then currently exists with a lot of tech. So the fact that 
replica users. I mentioned replica, this chatbot. Um, what's interesting about uh, replica that initially, I should say, was modeled, it, it started life as, as a bot called Roman Bot. There was a Russian tech entrepreneur, an investor named Eugenia Kudya, and her very good friend, Robin Mazarenko. They were two tech investors, techie types in Moscow. And Roman died in 2015. And uh, Eugenia was very heartbroken, very sad. So she took all this long correspondence, email correspondence, tech, uh, text chains, some blog posts that Roman, Roman had uh, made, and other just you know, digital data, fed it into this chatbot she made, and created basically a chatbot based on Roman, a Roman bot. And that's how this technology started. Now, Replica is much more sophisticated than RomanBot was. It's used, as I said, by about 25 million people. And the point is that the most hardcore base of users talk very openly about incorporating Replica into their everyday lives, not just like in a moment-to-moment -moment interaction the way that we would interact with Siri, but they wake up first thing in the morning and they say, hi, Replica, how are you? Oh, I'm good, how did you sleep? And the interaction starts. They take Replica out throughout the day when they need a little emotional boost when they're feeling low, when they are having some sort of thought they want to process. The point is, Replica is always there and accessible. It affords a kind of richer form of temporal engagement that I think helps feed into this illusion, not just of agency, but fosters a kind of emotional attachment that doesn't seem to arise in when we're interacting with other forms of tech. So again, I think time is relevant here. Yeah, great question though. I'll have to think more about that. It's a really good question. Thank you so much. Really interesting stuff and it really kind of resonates with something I've been working on recently. So I've been sort of thinking and writing about um, the experience or attribution of agency or virtual agency to music when we're listening oh, to, nice. to music. Okay. Uh, and thinking about also those dis different ways in which we have this really strong innate tendency to indeed attribute mental states to kind of inanimate things yeah. or objects and like the animation example that you mentioned. Um, and of course in, in, in music we have, you know, different um, features like expression of emotion or acoustic features expressive of emotion, these kind of motion, uh, like bodily motion features or a kind of a sense of embodiment and all these things that kind of give rise to these type of image, uh, imagined uh, agencies and narratives. And I was just thinking of comparing that to the case of AI or chatbots. And um, this thought of uh, the concept of uh, uncanny valley came to my mind. Yeah. Like when we get something, to it kind of becomes closer and closer to ac actual, like almost real human yeah. interaction, that it can actually become more difficult even to kind of achieve Good. that. Um, yeah. Yeah, like a sense of like a re real experience of kind of emergent agency or interacting with something. Uh, that there might be like when we get too close to like yes. <laughs> mimicking a human, that yeah. it becomes actually trickier. Perhaps. Yeah, so are you asking then if how that uncanny valley effect might kind of impact yeah. this fictional yeah, story? Yeah, yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's really nice. So there's a reason why I think I'm, I mean, if I was talking about not just chatbots, but um, like humanoid robots, I think then it's obvious because they d none of them look quite right. I mean, they're still, no matter how sophisticated they get, there's still just something off about the way they move, just their general kind of air. I think chatbots are a little different. Um, and the fact that it is pr the primarily text-based, where there's, I think, you know, less, there's less room to see through the illusion, so to speak, if you're just engaging with text as, as opposed to this you know, three-dimensional robot that doesn't look like the person or a real person that you're engaging with. Um, that's really interesting. I guess, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. One, maybe one other thing, and this in some ways connects to the previous question, I think maybe one way of sort of perhaps kind of neutralizing the uncanny valley effect isn't just, doesn't just have to do with kind of the richness of our ongoing more kind of diachronic interactions. It's the extent, and it goes back to what I, was, I should have said to you as well. There's some emerging technology that's, I think OpenAI has just announced this, this memory feature for, um, for chat GPT, where if you give uh, your, this chatbot permission, it will, as it already does, store bits of you know, your data that you've given it, or probably all of your data, depending on how much permission you give it. Um, but instead of deleting it after a certain amount of time, it will hang on to bits of it and resurface that data later on. And so it's a way of customizing and tailoring your chatbot too. It's a, it's a way of kind of building a sort of self-referential character to use a language 
that I was using here. So for example, if, it, if, if ChatGPT knows you, tend to you prefer to have your information presented in kind of a bullet point form, it will do that. If it knows that, um, I don't know, when you are asking it a philosophical question, you, you tend to prefer answers from a more continental philosophy as opposed to analytic philosophy, it will primarily cite those sources, way of customizing and tailoring the responses. And I guess the point is, not only is that poten potentially a way of I think giving the impression that these agents um, you know, do have more of an agency and independence. They remember the stuff they were talking about, uh, they were talking with us about earlier on. Um, I think it's a way of also kind of reducing this uncanny valley effect where you have a sense, it's almost like talking to someone who knows you well. You have a shared history, in other words. And it shows you, it gives you lots of cues along the way that this is someone you know well and you feel a kind of rapport and affinity with. You've shared time and history together. And I think that effect might lead to kind of a, a way of mitigating some of the uncanny effects, this feeling of having, not just sharing time, but sharing history with this, this digital agent. That's a great question, though, yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah, I can't wait to hear more about your current work on this stuff. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, um, I wondered uh, what, uh, considering the body, would do with this yeah. hypothesis. And, uh, I was afraid I was, someone was going to ask that, yeah. I was uh, interested, or the interest was raised by some of your uh, slides showing bodies, like the humanoid robot, then the, animate, uh, the animal, and uh, the screenshot of the video game, and all of those have bodies, and those tended to be the examples with more emotional power components. Yeah. And then uh, the main key examples did not have a body, or perhaps the dog's microphone or some... So, there might be plausible hypothesis to assume that uh, this uh, emotional attachment and the idea that the life continues, if it's out of view, depends on it having a body, perhaps with physicality. Um, so perhaps there's different kinds of bodies, of course. Some yeah. can shut off and on, and some not. Uh, but so what was your rationale to choose a key example which does not have a body, and how would the body yeah. The no, that's great. I mean, I think it's an uncanny valley question. I, and I hadn't thought about it quite this way until, until you guys have both just asked these questions. But I think, as, so I, and I say this as someone who games, and who I really, I do enjoy gaming in, par, gaming in part because I do find game worlds like uh, Night City and Cyberpunk 2077 and other rich, complex game worlds so immersive. But there is always an uncanny valley effect. And no matter how good the programming is, no matter how well designed these game worlds are, you always, there's, there's always either, you know, a character will, will smile a certain way or move a certain way, you see a certain kind of stiffness or something a bit is off about their smile and you remember in that moment, okay, this is not a person, it's a game world. So in a sense, the more information we give a viewer, in a sense, the easier it is to ruin the fiction. Whereas in, if it's just text-based, I think it lets the, the user fill in more of the background details, which I think sustain the fiction. So for example, uh, I was sort of begrudgingly dragged into the, the world of WhatsApp and texting more frequently during COVID. I, was, I, I like tech, but I really hate texting and social media type stuff generally. And, um, but during COVID, a lot of this is all of our friendship groups moved online as we all did. We had to find new ways of staying connected. And so I got in the habit of texting people a lot more. It was, it was kind of brought into a bunch of text chains. And what, have I, what I've enjoyed learning about interacting with people via WhatsApp, for example, is I not only recognize the tone of each individual in the style of their texting, a lot of my reaction, my emotional response to what people text comes from me imagining what they look like the moment they're texting. So if my friend is giving kind of a snarky remark the way that she always does, which is why we love her, that comes through in the tone of both what she says, but also I imagine her at her phone kind of snarkily typing out this response with a particular look on her face that she always gets when she's queuing up this really snark snarky response and then she lets it go. I fill in the fiction. I can't see her face, but I imagine what she looks like at that moment. And I think the fact that I'm only seeing the text allows me to construct more of the fiction, which I think, you know, maybe again makes it makes me less inclined to experience a kind of unvalley, uh, uncanny valley effect. And I think this, to support this, those of you who, has anyone played with the Vision Pro, the Apple Vision Pro, whatever it's called? No, me neither. It's, so the new headset, the Apple headset, virtual a VR headset. So one of the features, one of the widely mocked features, and I should say, suppose it's a great piece of hardware. I don't have any interest in the VR headset. I'm not sure face computing is the, uh, the future at least in this format, but one of, uh, it's a great piece of hardware, but one of the most widely mocked
features of the Apple headset are there. I think they call them personas. And they're, they're like basically images of, um, you, have, you can FaceTime with someone, and your headset will summon a kind of image that looks sort of like the person you're FaceTiming with, but not exactly. It's a strong, uncanny valley effect. It's like a soft focus. It's almost like someone tried to do a bad, like, kind of painting of this person, but, and like ran it through a couple of soft focus filters, and it's just, it's clearly off. And it's unsettling, and it was widely mocked because it, didn't, it doesn't look like the person you're interacting with. It ruins the fiction completely. And it stands out because so much else about this headset works well. You really feel that you're in this alternative environment. You're, you have the, a strong sense of inhabiting this fictional environment this headset creates. And the point of that is, that's, that's an example in which I think Apple tries to give you too much. It doesn't let the viewer do some of the fiction constructing work uh, on, for their, on their own, essentially. And that's what leads to, I think, a greater tendency to experience uncan uncan uncanny valley effect. So that's not really an answer to your question in the sense that we didn't think about any of that when we made this decision. I just made all that up as 30 seconds ago. Um, but I think the reason we chose not to focus on the body is because most of the existing tech, whether it's chatbots of the dead, whether it's some of the other AI systems we were talking about, are not embodied. The social robots, the more embodied stuff, that's a whole other separate category that deserves its own separate analysis. Yeah, thank you, though. Yeah, thank you so much. Very interesting uh, talk and also very interesting discussion. <laughs> Perhaps I'm returning to some previous points, but I, I, I'm just wondering if there are actually two things circulating here. The first is like these AI procedures or high-tech uh, functions that could also be seen as tools, perhaps, and then you have these imagined agents. Yeah. And it seems that you are interested in those instances where they, these high-tech procedures are um, represented, so to speak, uh, or understood as agents. But is it possible to also imagine that these functions or tools like for example, when making music, you use a lot of very high-tech procedures. Yeah. It's n you don't necessarily think of those as agents. Yeah. But would you still call them agents, even though they are, yeah, kind of pure yeah. procedures, tools, functions that are performed by highly kind of, yeah, sophisticated technology? Can you give me an example? So as a non-musician, what do you... And that's no, for example, the Spawn of? example, it's... Um, uh, I mean, you can you can feed things into a technological system that actually mm. gives you a lot of things back. Uh, so just even voices, how you manipulate the sound, uh, like Ableton or something. Processing yeah. things that are really, yeah, uh, completely changing the result. Yeah. But you would still not, I think, I, I would still not uh, think of it as having agency. It's more a tool or a procedure. Yeah. Yeah, so it's... Just a thought. No, that's yeah. good. And again, I think hopefully, you know, the, the story that Tom and I try and tell kind of fills in some of the detail about why, um, why we might not include, you know, agency, not, might not attribute agency in those cases as opposed to something like Spawn. And I guess the idea, once again, is there isn't, um, uh, there, I, I think Tom and I would probably say there's not like a genuine interaction happening there. It's more of a kind of controlling or maybe a reaction, if we want to use that expression. So it's not as though, I mean, there's, there's, some, there's a pretty kind of set, I guess, output or end result most of the time. You put something in, you know roughly what's going to happen. You set certain parameters, you play with the sound a certain way, you run it through a certain filter or something, and what it spits back to you is pretty predictable. Now, it's, so there's, not, there's, I think, of less of an inclination to attribute agency in those cases. I think that's part of it. But I think also, there's also a kind of a more a narrowly defined set of potential results for this interaction. Mm -hmm. So you kind of know, even if there's some unpredictability there, you know roughly what's going to happen in a way you don't always with Spawn, for instance, or some of the other self-supervised learning uh, agents that we're talking about. Do you think that like the response is unpredictable? That's a, that's a key thing. But I think much of the response that you will get from these interactions yeah. with technology uh, the, would not like, be represented or thought about, I think, as agents are, it could be very unpredictable. Actually, yeah. some of it produced things that you would <laughs> never be able to imagine at all. And I was also thinking, yeah, I that's always good, think that's about good. this um, 
example of serialism, Pierre Boulez, who kind of had all these automated procedures yeah. for generating uh, compositional material. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now that's uh, really so, nice. so it's it's an old story in a way, at yeah. least in the field of, of music using these kinds of things. No, definitely. And yeah. I, as you were talking, I was thinking I used to really be into um, an electronic band called Autecra. Has anyone heard of Autecra? Okay, so at least one cultural reference that someone got. Great, okay. Um, and so they're this long-running kind of um, English experimental electronic art, uh, band. When I used to live in Copenhagen, it's a duo. I saw them in Denmark uh, perform, and this was during a period, this was about, what, 14 years ago, I can't remember the name of the albums, maybe you remember. There were a couple albums they released that were just really just kind of just intense, dissonant, kind of generative noise, essentially. And when they performed, they performed um, in a venue with all the lights off, so it was pitch, pitch black. You walk in, and uh, I remember kind of leaning against a back wall, and so I, because I just, I knew it was gonna be intense, I'd heard stories. And they played this music at an incredibly high volume. I think what they basically did is just like push, push a few buttons and let the software they designed kind of just do its thing. And in, it was an interesting kind of experiment in what counts as authorship and artistic performance, but a lot of it was spontaneous, just random kind of intense, unanticipated noise. And I don't know in that instance, I mean, I can't remember. Well, let's put it this way, let's go back to what you were talking about. There, there were moments where I did have a strong feeling that the music itself had a kind of agency. It just, I was attributing, and it wasn't just because of certain kind of movements and patterns within this noise, trying to latch on to anything that I could make sense of and, and ground myself. It was so overwhelming and chaotic. But there was something about even just the unpredictability of the way that music was unfolding that was prompting something like an attribution of agency there. And I hadn't really thought about it until this moment. It felt like the music had kind of a life of its own, even independent of certainly the audience and the two um, uh, guys making the music. So that's not an answer to your question other than just an, an acknowledgement that it does get messy and complicated. I'm not sure I have a good answer to that about, you know, what is it? Is it is, it's not enough just to have spontaneity and uncertainty. I think there, there needs to be a sense in which we have a certain kind of history with these systems, and which is why I think it's not just self-supervised learning, but there's a sense in which a kind of a shared history and a sense of sharing time with them that's also important that maybe we don't have quite the same way in the examples you're talking about. But maybe that's not true. So it's a long-winded way of saying, I don't have a good answer. I don't know. That's a great question. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, just following what uh, Anne just mentioned, um, because uh, I did my master's thesis on human AI co-creation of Oh, hands. amazing. So okay. I also have oh, like this an expert in this stuff. Yeah, philosophical awesome. um, reflection. And... I don't know, like, especially this part when we consider something a tool or when we consider it as a, yeah. a collaborator. Uh, in my experience, it was more related to the intention you put in that interaction. Mm. Um, because, for example, this AI dancer was capable to generate dance, like new dance, yeah. that it was not a reflection of what I was doing or it was not mirroring what I was doing. But... Um, it was producing something that it was uh, unexpected for me. Yeah. Um, so in that manner, we can say that the, the AI was an agent because it was able to generate something new according to yeah. its strategies and creativity and so on. But then it can still be used as a tool if I am keep manipulating it or puppeting. Yeah. But to be able to collaborate with this AI dancer, what I had to do was to let myself being influenced by the movements it was doing. Yeah. But at the same time, the AI ha had to be able to be influenced by what I was doing in real time. Yes. So we actually okay. struggled a lot uh, because I uh, collaborate in this research with Benedict, who also mm -hmm. is uh, here at Pritmo. And like to create this, um, let's say, uh, possibility that we both agents were able to um, manipulate each other yeah. in real time. Because if I, as a human, have all, all the power on the AI, I am puppeting it, and therefore yeah. it becomes a tool. But when the AI also has the possibility to uh, influence the way of how I am moving, then we can consider it as a collaboration. Yeah. And of course, to achieve this, the human has to let himself 
being uh, influenced by whatever is happening. And, and what, if I can ask you to turn this around on you now, since you're the expert on this, and so what, what, what was it that put you in a position where you were poised to let yourself be influenced by these systems? Was, was it a conscious, like explicit decision you made, to go back to a distinction that I talked about before, kind of explicit sort of fictionalist stance, something more kind of embodied and habitual? What, what did you do to kind of open yourself up to being moved this way? Because I, I was analyzing my performance while dancing. Yeah. So I was thinking, am I dancing for the AI or am I dancing with the AI? Yeah. Is the AI dancing with me or is it dancing for me? Yeah. So to achieve this level of um, interaction or collaboration, I realized, I, I, I tried to put this situation in a human context and what I yeah. would do if I am dancing with another human. And then I analyzed that when we uh, are creating something in real time, like, uh, like we, when we are uh, improvising dance, uh, the, the other person, it's not only generating something according yeah. to their background and so on, but uh, he's also being influenced by the decisions I am making in the moment. Yeah. So somehow... We characterize that as kind of a self-referentiality. You see bits of what you've caused this person do, to do being reflected back at you in the movements and responses that they're making, and vice yeah. versa. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, yeah. it was to have like this cyclical uh, effect, Yeah. Um, because also this uh, aspect of time was really important, because uh, I analyzed like previous AI systems that were able to uh, interact with human AI, but the problem was that it was not in real time. So this mm. gap of, of time was affecting yeah. the, the collaborative um, aspect because if you, you let yourself take a rational decision of, oh, uh, the AI did this movement, then I will plan what I'm going to do. Yeah. There is something of manipulating the previous input. Whilst when you are doing it in real time, somehow this uh, yeah. like rational thinking is suspended and you are just doing by intuition and then you can achieve like That's this That's nice. Flow. So I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what I, what I understand you describing is a kind of a process of a kind of entrainment, essentially, yeah, 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 a kind yeah. of a real-time entrainment, which is, I think, really yeah. key. And I think taking that concept and some of this analysis of entrainment and putting it in the context of interactions with artificial systems, like whether it's Spawn, whether it's other systems, whether it's digital assistants, chatbots, I think would be really interesting. But that's really key. That's if you need a, a description of the mechanism that enables this experience of sharing time the way that I keep referring to, I think looking at coordination dynamics and entrainment in particular is a way of getting at that. So yeah, that's a great example. Thank you for that. I really like that. Maybe carrying on with that thread a little bit, what seems similar to me with uh, some of Diego's example, obviously Diego talked a little bit about the, the uh, interactive, de the development of interaction with these systems, but one of the challenges was setting up a, a kind of a gestural vocabulary that was interpretable also to the machine. Mm -hmm. And when we're talking about chatbot examples, again, you mentioned there's a kind of constraint to the type of interaction that is being simulated in that case. Yeah and it's using the specific mode of interaction that is practiced where we are used to reading a lot of intention in very little information. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it, it seems interesting to consider then the specifics of the type of interactions that we have developed a sensitivity to. Good. That seems to be very, there are sort of narrow areas yeah. where AI can easily slip in, but then there's a huge range yes. of interactions that are well outside of that kind of convenient control. That's beautifully put, yeah. In relationship to music, I think music offers a really interesting example for this because when it comes to at least sort of active musical engagement, like when you're going to a show, you can experience a sense of participation without, let's say, the musicians on stage adapting to you. Mm -hmm. And it's an instance where we are experiencing this kind of joint agentfulness without a lot of direct reaction, yeah. uh, which sets up maybe a different opportunity for the impression of fictional agency through music. Yeah. than what we might get in these systems where we do actually have an expectation of this sort of back and forth. Yeah, that's really nice. I mean, I wonder, you know, in that scenario, so I, I go to a lot of gigs, and sometimes they are in larger venues where, 
you know, maybe, the, maybe my experience, with maybe the musicians, the performers are, are responding to certain things that the audience is doing, but maybe my experience is somehow a little bit out of sync with the rest of the audience, and so maybe I'm into the show, but not quite the same way, and uh, that, that is complicated, I guess. I mean, in your scenario, I think very often, though, part of how I experience the gig is going to be, in, of course, not just in terms of what's happening on the stage, but how the audience itself is responding. There's kind of this, you know, this joint attentional structure that emerges where I'm aware that not just what's going on the stage, but that's this whole audience that is also aware of what's going on the stage and somehow they're a constituent part of my experience. And so I think that has to be part of this story in a complicated way. I don't fully know how to weave into it, but I think you've made a really but, but great point. But that's an, an instance where your own individual engagement yeah. is kind of secondary. <laughs> yes. You could be there hating the show. Yeah. And if the audience loves it, that's the message that the stage receives. And no, so that's there's true. a kind of a separateness that becomes uh, at least familiar yeah. in that environment that yeah. has all the trappings of interaction and that has all these sort of characteristic patterns to interactive yeah. systems that still doesn't, doesn't need you quite in the same way. No, that's a good point, yeah. That's great, that's a great example. I've had, and I've had many experiences, not many, I've had a few experiences like that. I've been the surly one in the back not enjoying the gig when everyone else is clearly yeah. super into it. <laughs> it's a funny place to be in, phenomenologically. Great, so uh, if no one has any further questions, we don't have any online questions. Um, I can invite to further interaction by the coffee machine, uh, where we have apparently a chocolate fest uh, lined up. Wow. Thank you so much, Joe, well, for a wonderful Thank you paper. all. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Mm.